So, over my last four episodes, my first four real podcasts, I guess you could say, I spent a lot of time outlining things that we considered are going to be the cyberpunk dystopia, or have become the cyberpunk dystopia. And it occurs to me that one of the, the benefits to doing this is it really outlines a lot of the issues. But there's no point in outlining the issues if we don't provide solutions. See, a person can, can sit here and whine on the internet about all the problems in society and how things are going to hell in a handbasket. But if you're not actually proposing solutions, then all your words are worth are wasted oxygen. And so one of the things I learned when I was on the campaign trail this year was that people want specific solutions to problems. <clears throat> not just broad platitudes, not just ideas in the sky, but real concrete solutions. And I couldn't always provide them, which is one of the reasons I lost. And that's something I will be working on very hard in 2022. However, one of the things I do believe I have a solution for is one of the most ancient problems, the things that we say we can never avoid. See, there are two things that we think we can avoid. We can't avoid death and taxes. And I am not smart enough to figure out how to avoid death. I mean, I've got a broad idea of how immortality could theoretically be achieved. If we could overcome the whole, you can die of immortality and we just call it cancer thing. But the other issue, the issue of taxes, is a solvable problem. And I do say taxes are a problem. As someone who is broadly libertarian, I fall under the, the group of people who say, generally, a lot of them say, taxation is theft. And from a broad standpoint, that is true. Because the government doesn't ask you to pay taxes, they simply take them. And in the event that you they can't take them and you have to pay in, they do so at the point of a gun. You don't pay your taxes, you go to jail. Now, there are definitely reasons for this. Government must be funded. Uh, unless you're an ANCAP or an ANSOC, or ANCOM, rather, there's no possible way to really fund government without taxes, at least not in our current situation. Or is there? See... I believe that the fact that we have taxes, which is really an anachronism hearkening back to 3000 BC, is just that we haven't gotten creative enough. We've gotten too comfortable with the idea of paying taxes year after year after year. And what this has created is governments that are theoretically beholden to their taxpayers, but really aren't, because they can just take those taxes out. And if you fail to pay them because you're upset with your legislatures, they simply go there with the police and take them from you or take your assets. So what's the solution to this? Well, there is what I consider to be a libertarian solution to the tax problem. And I'm going to present this to you tonight. Before I do, I am going to get into what taxes are, what their history is, and why we are using this ancient system of government funding to this day. And then I'm going to provide you the solution. So you can't find a solution without really understanding the problem. And I think part of the reason we haven't solved this problem is that we don't really understand it very well so buckle up folks we're talking taxes and we're navigating the cyberpunk dystopia this is the julian mcbain show okay so let's get started by really discussing a history, essentially, of, ta of taxes. Uh, the origin of taxes can be traced back, at least in record, to ancient Egypt. About anywhere between 3000 and 2800 BC is where the first actual record of taxes was recorded. And taxes back then looked a lot different than they do now. Obviously, the monetary systems were very primitive by comparison to what we have today. Uh, I don't even know that coinage was really a thing overall back then. I'm sure they had some sort of, of exchange, but oftentimes it wasn't anything looking like what we have now. The first forms of taxes were called corvée. And a corvée is a tax of labor. You owed the sovereign your labor in order for you to pay to be there. And in fact, in their mind, it was forced labor. And in fact, the ancient Egyptian word for labor 
was synonymous with taxes. This is how integrated labor and taxes were. And in fact, labor was a form of tax paying right up until 1940 in some places. In fact, um, the feudal system, which the last feudal nation stopped being a purely feudal nation in the, I want to say the 90s. Yeah, the island of Sark was is is technically still a feudal um, a feudal state, part of the the Duchy of Normandy. I believe it's part of the Jersey Islands. I believe that's still technically called the Duchy of Normandy, um, with some democratic institutions that they de they've democratized to a certain extent. But the the seigneur is still the feudal lord and still pays rent to the sovereign the old-fashioned way. But anyway, they paid a tax in labor, which means that so many days of year, they owed taxes to the government. They owed labor to the government to pay for their right to live there or the privilege of living within that state. If they failed to do so, of course, they'd be put in prison. Of course, because it was forced labor, all they end up doing is instead of saying it's your turn to hold the shovel, they put a chain around their neck and say it's your turn to hold the shovel. And maybe you'd have to pay a penalty by doing an extra day or two of labor. Basically the same thing. Um, as that type of tax developed, and as we moved through the, the classical period into the medieval period, it was still part of the taxation system, oftentimes in a feudal manner. What you would do is part of your rents, rents and taxes during the feudal times were basically the same thing because your feudal lord owned the land you lived on. So basically you were renting from them, but it had the same function as taxes. So there was a time when rent and taxes were synonymous with each other. I'm sure there are going to be people going, aha, but it's true. Um, that's not a justification not to pay your rent. So... What they do is, oftentimes as a form of rent in the, in the Middle Ages or a form of labor, you pay a percentage of your yield from your farm because all of the, the serfs and freedmen, the pre peasants, depending on what period in the feudal area you were in and what area you were in, everyone seems to think that feudalism was the same everywhere. It wasn't, not by a long shot. But let's say you're a peasant, you have this, this piece of land that the sovereign has rented to you, by you paying taxes so this is your strip of land on here you've got your vegetables and your potatoes which is technically a vegetable but it's tuber i'm sorry i don't really consider potatoes a vegetable they're a starch sue me um they take like 10 percent of your crop yield and out of your 30 chickens they might take a dozen eggs a day and out of your cows they might take one bucket of milk right because money was a lot less common. I mean, they did have coinage in the Middle Ages, as I'm sure they did in ancient Egypt, but it wasn't nearly as it wasn't as easy a medium for the castle so much as to just say you owe me this piece of your yield, and then they don't have to worry about oh you pay us coin for the taxes and we pay you back coin for the stuff. It was just a different way of doing things. This was under mercantilism, and I know that a lot of people like to like to conflate the era of capitalism and socialism all the way back ad infinitum, but it really isn't. Capitalism and socialism themselves are actually very modern ideas. And I'll probably do a whole episode on capitalism versus socialism coming up here pretty quick. I've got a number of things I need to do episodes on. I'm noticing it's starting to spiral out of control now. But under mercantilism, that worked. So they developed different forms of taxes for different situations because every nation did things just a little bit differently. Most of these developed in the Middle Ages, where I, why, which, which is why I'm going to focus on the Middle Ages in order to really get out the idea of where taxes truly developed. Because there are plenty of ways you could have developed taxes, and most of your more primitive, simple tax structures are easily... Out, have an easy allegory to a modern tax. For instance, uh, uh, tariffs are the most easy. You paid a fee to the dock in order to bring your ship in, right? Well, that's a fee. Well, essentially, since the dock's owned by the king, it's also a form of tax, if you want to take it broadly speaking. And so, but the, now the difference between that form of a tax, like a tariff, as opposed to an income tax, and why I think tariffs are more justifiable than an income tax, I can get into 
more deeply later, but the basic idea is when, uh, when you pay a tariff, you're paying to bring your goods into a country to sell. You're paying a fee to that country in order to be allowed to compete against their providers of the same good, right? When you pay an income tax, the government simply says, oh, you made $300, 30 of that's mine. Thank you. See the difference? So let's get into the types of taxes and some of these origins, and then we're going to get into my solution. Because if I'm not providing solutions, the only point of this podcast is for me to sit up here and whine a lot. I don't like being a whiner. Let's see what... Shut up. Um, okay. Types of taxes. Most of the things I'm going to go through now are going to be obsolete. So I'm going to go through some of the more historical taxes, where they kind of came from, and then we're going to talk about modern taxes and some of the the benefits they've provided us and the problems behind them. Okay. So seniorage was one of the early taxes, and this was literally a tax on the creation of money. Now, most of you are going, how do you tax the stamping of coins? And I mean, literally, it's like, okay, well, I'm a feudal lord and I'm minting coins for my duchy, right? For the for an example. Well, because I minted 3,000 coins, I owe 300 coins to the king. I created money. I owe that money to the king. More accurately, it's a tax on the accumulation of debt. And I don't mean on the debtor. I'm, I mean on the debt E, the person who is lending money. See, when you lend money, you're creating it in a form or fashion. So, um, example, in modern banking, when you, as the depositor, deposit your $3,000 in the bank, the bank is required to hold a reserve. I believe the current reserve is anywhere between 10 and 20%. For the sake of this example, we'll say 10. So out of that $3,000 you have deposited into the bank, often in the form of a CD, because um, liquid uh, savings accounts are not good places to store money for banks. They can't guarantee it's going to be there tomorrow, so a CD locks it up. The bank can now lend out, of that $3,000, $2,700. It's 3000 minus 300 which is 10%. They can lend out the other $2,700. They have just created $2,700 in money. That does not mean it's absolute. Monetary systems work differently than printed dollars. Not literally printing the money, but there is an additional $2,700 in the system. It's paper. So, okay. Now that I've created that $2,700, under seniorage, I would have to pay a portion of that, as the bank, back to the sovereign. And in modern ages, we kind of do that too in FDIC membership fees that banks pay to pay for the insurance for their depositors. See, seniorage still exists in some way, shape, or form. We just don't call it that anymore. It's classified as a premium because the FDIC is an insurance organization, even though it's government owned. So that was seniorage. And again, this is something that has an allegorical um successor today or it has a, a an spiritual su successor today other ones include tillage soakage and bougage I, I don't even know how to fucking pronounce that um and this is literally a tax on feudal dependence this is what we went through before with the whole 10 percent of the crop this is tallage and tallage is how you as a feudal tenant or peasant would pay your man lord for living there since I've already gone through all that, I'm not going to reiterate it because there's no point. Tithes paid to the church, which were probably the purest form of tax for a very long time because they weren't tied to paying a lord for living there. You were paying the church not to classify you as a heretic. So basically, that's, that's the literal use of paying money at the point of a gun. Um, another one very similar in nature, although this could be considered an early form of insurance, of ransom insurance. Uh, Danegelds. Danegelds were taxes paid to the crown of England, specifically, so that when the Danes came to raid, they could be there with the Danegeld saying, here's the money, now go away. Yeah, yeah. It was literally the first version of ransom insurance, government organized, so they taxed the people on it in a form of 
I would assume it's a form of payroll tax of, if anything, and not that they had payroll back then, but something similar or an income tax of some sort. Um, so that when the Danes came to go kill all your villagers, instead the village would be out there with their goods and, and, and money and, and shit and be like, here, here's the stuff for you. Please don't burn down our village. And the Danes are pretty smart people. They're like, well, they're just out here giving us stuff and we don't know what else we need to do with it. Yeah, sure, you betcha. So, okay, if we load up the ship with all these goods, we don't really need to raid the village. It's a hell of a lot less work if they just give us all the goods we were looking for in the first place. Danes weren't stupid. I mean, okay, so the berserks would probably kind of be a little irritated and didn't get to go berserk on folks, but what you gonna do? Um, later... The Dane Guild, after the, the fall of the Viking Age, the Dane Guild actually got replaced. The Dane Guild got replaced by something called Kovkage, and I believe I'm pronouncing that wrong. Someone can fact check me on it. But Dane Guild went from being the ransom paid to the Danes to money taxed in order to fund military expenditures. So they eventually changed the name to Kovkage, which even today, military expenditures is a large proportion of any nation's budget. Uh, in the case of the United States, it's probably our one of our largest line items. Well, it's not one line item, but you get what I mean. It's a large proportion of our spending is military spending, even when we're not at war all over the world. So now that we've gone through different types of, of ancient taxes, let's define taxes. And I think I kind of touched on this earlier, but let's get into like the real meat of the definition. And this definition comes from Wikipedia. And it is a transfer of wealth from individuals or businesses to the government. And I like to add the little bit in there because it's true at the point of a gun. Now, it's true. The government doesn't come to your home every day or every month and, and point a gun at you and say time to pay up. But if you fail to pay, they will come in with guns and say pay up or you're going to jail. This is where the, the folks in the libertarian group, the libertarian corner of the political, um, the hell is it called? The, the political coordinates. God damn it. I can't remember what it's called anymore. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, they chart it on a graph that's actually four sections so you can tell if you're authoritarian right, libertarian right authoritarian left and libertarian left and the left and right only refer to economics not to social status um which is why you've got like your, your communists up in the upper right on the upper left and your um libertarians in the lower right and your sock dems in the lower left and your um more authoritarian right-wing groups they say the fascists are up there i've seen fascist economic policy it's kind of on the right but it's not a really good place for it there's no real good allegory for it but traditionally it's been placed on the right so the fascists would be upper right hand corner technically speaking um I'll, pro I'll probably do a whole podcast on totalitarian systems and actually i might do one on each one of the ones in the 20th century all of which were responsible for millions of deaths from um from nazism and fascism to soviet communism versus maoist communism um, the dictatorships of Pol Pot and all that. All of these are actually really important to the way that we think about things as we move into this further and further into this despotic future that we are, we're staring straight in the face. Uh, but that's beyond the scope of tonight. Um, okay, so let's look at the four main modern taxes. I mean, there are plenty of other taxes that go with this, forms of fees, things like that. But oftentimes, the, f the four that we most commonly deal with are these. Income tax, sales tax, and tariffs. And one that is not in the United States, and in not most countries, but it keeps getting proposed, is a wealth tax. And I'm only including that not because we have to deal with it on a regular basis from a payment uh, point of view, but because it keeps getting mentioned. And so I think it needs to be covered. So let's talk about income tax. Income tax, of course, is a percentage of your pay that you earn that goes to the government to pay for services. This is the easiest way to tax people and possibly the fairest because if, if, you, if there is a sort of thing as a fair tax. Um, but let's, let's say, for instance, that taxes are a necessary evil. We can't get around them. 
okay? And that's basically how I see taxes in the current way we run things. I do think there's a way to replace them. I will be getting to that. But in the system as we have currently designed it over time, taxes are a necessary evil. And so income tax is by far the fairest way to tax things, kind of. Kind of. Different definitions of fair, but I can see where they would say it would be the fairest way to tax things in a lot of ways. I honestly think the sales tax is even fairer than the income tax, but I'll get to that shortly. Income tax is, of course, a percentage of your, your income that gets taxed and sent to the federal government or to any government, state government, federal government. For most countries, they're, you're broken up into maybe provinces or districts and municipalities. I'm using the U.S. system as an example. Even though it's not a great allegory to other systems for my international viewers, and I'm going to go into why it's a little bit different at the end of this podcast just to get a good idea. And I'm going to go into a whole thing on the U.S. system in a future podcast. That's coming up probably in the new year. Um, the reason it works, and it's relatively fair insofar as any other tax system goes, is that there's three ways you can tax things. You can tax them regressively, which is bullshit. Where the poorer you are, the higher percentage you pay. You've got a flat tax, which is probably the best sort of tax, even though there's an argument that it's regressive, where... Everyone pays the same percentage. Now, there are a lot of nations that do this. Norway and Sweden have a flat tax. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, fact check me on Sweden. Sweden might have a small, uh, a s small number of progressions. So they might technically have a progressive tax. Norway's 45% across the board. That's what everyone pays, 45% of their income. And that was true as of the beginning of this year, uh, for the 2019 tax year. I don't know if that's changed in the light of COVID-19. Um, but when I looked it up for their, 29, their 2019 tax year, it was still 45% flat tax on average. Um, I'm sure that they have ways to do like deductions and shit like that. I'm not an expert on Norwegian tax systems, but they do have a flat tax. So that's really important to look at. The, the third way is the progressive tax structure. And that's what we have here in the United States. Now, if you're in the U.S., you pretty much know what a progressive tax structure is. At certain levels of income, you bracket up and you pay more of a marginal tax rate. Now, what a lot of people assume, and this is incorrect, is that, oh, I went from 30000 to 32000 So now instead of paying 10% in taxes, I'm paying 25. That's 25% off my whole income. And now I'm actually bringing home less. No, incorrect. What it is, is you have the standard deduction, which means that's not even counted for income. And then you have the first bracket up to this amount where the, where the cutoff is. Let's say from um, 12000 to 20000 or 25000 you pay 10%, which these are not accurate numbers. I don't have the IRS website up. This is just for example. So 10% of that $25,000 of that um, money between 12000 and 25000 which is 13000 is taxed at 10%. So that's $1,300. It's $1,300 part of my tax bill. And so I'm going to pull out a calculator here so that I'm not completely moronic. Add to that from 25 to 32, you're paying 25%. So 25 to 32 is $7,000 times 0.25. That's 1750 plus the 1300. Therefore, my tax liability for the year is $3,050. That's basically how a good progressive, a good progressive tax structure operates and it just keeps going up and up and up until you reach whatever level the government decides is a good cap on the amount that you take from income now there's a lot of argument over this some people think less is better others think that more is better and there have been arguments over like during the the great new deal not the great new deal the new deal period i keep i mixed green and great we're not talking about the green new deal that's a whole other subject. During the New Deal period, during this Cold War, they taxed a lot of the highest wealth at 95%. And a lot of people try to justify this as a reason to tax the, the wealthy at a much higher rate. There are reasons this worked during that time period and it won't work now. That warrants its own podcast as well. Needless to say, that's not the reason we're doing this podcast. Like The number of tangents I could go on in this podcast are so broad, we could be here for four hours. I'm not gonna do that to you. I'm gonna lose y'all before then. So we're gonna focus on the tax structure itself. Um, and that's basically how income taxes operate. 
The next is sales tax. Now, I think sales taxes, if we're forced to use taxes, I think sales taxes are the better option. Sales taxes are basically you get to keep all your money when you get paid out from your from your job, right? From your job, from dividends, from stocks you own, from your retirements, what have you. Awesome. When you go to buy stuff, that's when you pay. Some things will be tax exempt. Food. If you buy nothing but food, you'll never pay a penny in taxes. Right? That's a good idea. In this way, the poorest people will still pay the least amount of tax. They still have to buy clothes. And you could put a uh, varied tax structure based on what people are buying, like clothing, which is considered a staple, would have, if any tax at all, a very low sales tax, whereas a, um, a more frivolous item like a video game system might have a 25% tax. And so... With this, you're only paying taxes on the things, the luxuries you buy. The staple items you don't pay tax, you pay a very nominal tax, like maybe 5%. On a luxury item, like a television, or a PlayStation, or a computer even, even though computers are less luxury and more ubiquitous now. Let's say a, a, a computer system designed for X versus Y. Um, like if you have a, a basic business computer, maybe it'll have lower tax. If it has like a 1080 graphics card, well, that's definitely a luxury item, blah. And I mean, th there's reason legislatures exist. They'd sort that shit out. But with a sales tax, because you get to keep all your money, you're not just being arbitrarily taxed on your labor. You're just being taxed on the things that you use that money to purchase. And it's based on the amount of luxury you decide to buy for yourself. The third one is tariffs. And even though I broadly think that taxation is a form of theft, I don't think tariffs fall into this. Now, tariffs are generally considered a form of tax. I more consider tariffs to be a fee. And there is a difference between taxes and fees. A fee is something you pay in order to use a service directly. You don't pay the fee unless you use that service. With a tariff, a ship or a business is paying a country to be allowed to move goods into that country. It's a fee. It's like buying a ticket. Now, there is a way that that could easily be corrupted, and in fact, I don't know that there's ever been a tariff system that doesn't suffer from corruption. So it definitely has its problems. The difference is that with tariffs, they don't have to come in. They can go market their goods elsewhere. Now, obviously, if this is the main primary method of funding for a country, this could be an issue. But most, if not all, other countries have tariffs. With the exception of where we have free trade agreements, we pay, we pay tariffs to ship our shit out. If I want to go sell something in Dubai, I'm probably going to be paying a tariff on the items that I, I import into Dubai. It's just the way things work. Now, I'm not an expert at Dubai tax structures or anything like that. I was using it as an example. I apologize to the people of Dubai if I made that mistake, which is actually Qatar. Dubai is the city. Qatar is the nation. I'm going to get flamed for that. I already know it. That's fine. The fourth one is wealth tax. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's been brought up a lot in news media, in circles that I'm in. There's a problem with wealth tax. And... This is one of the things that I would love to have a debate with um, Bernie Sanders, who is actually my one of my senators here in Vermont. The problem with a wealth tax is most wealth is not liquid. And in fact, m almost all wealth is, in, is illiquid. See, I can ha be, have a net worth of $100 million, which is about where they want to start the wealth tax. Let's say I'm a billionaire. Let's say I'm a billionaire. I'm Jeff Bezos, right? Bezos, however it's pronounced. So I'm a billionaire. Let's say I have $10 billion. I don't know his net worth. I'm just using it as an example. And then they want to levy a 3% wealth tax. 3% on $10 billion is $300 million. Now that's a lot of money. And you're thinking, well, it's just a drop in the bucket if you've got $10 billion, right? Yeah, but that $300 million isn't cash. See, it's if I'm Jeff Bezo Bezos, it's Amazon stock. Or if I'm Donald Trump, it's a tower. So to pay that tax, I have to offload the asset in the market 
in order to get the money to pay the wealth tax. Now, this is much easier in the form of stock than it is in the form of a building, but that comes with its own problems. Because if I am to liquidate that much stock, if I'm Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and I need to offload $300 million in stock, I am going to crash the price of the asset overnight. And then my net worth goes down. So do I owe the original $300 million? Or do I owe the $10 million that is now 10% of my wealth because I destroyed the, the uh, stock price or the building valuation because I had to offload it really quickly? It's a hard answer. That's a hard question to answer and no one has the answer for it. And so this is why wealth taxes, broadly speaking, don't work. Okay. I've talked about the problem. I've bitched about the problem. Now it's time to talk about the solution. How do we solve the problem of taxes? How do we make it so that the nation can still move forward? We still have a military that can defend us. Because even though I believe in the non-aggression principle, there is the line in the non-aggression principle that reads, fuck around and find out. Um, which literally means... I will not be the first to aggress, but if uh, once aggressed upon, I will use every means uh, necessary to defend myself. That's really what that line means. Because I can already see some of my friends in, in watching this cringing. So, how do we pay for essential services? We can't let the destitute just be left to, to die. That's one of the problems with um, anarcho-capitalism. And I actually explored this in my in the book series I wrote with my ex-wife, the Dead World series, because it was an ANCAP world. And as we were going into the second book, I realized the problems with being a true anarcho-capitalist. Because when you're an anarcho-capitalist, oftentimes the destitute are left to die. There are roughly 10% of the population can't earn a living enough to keep up with the actual needs of the market so that they can feed themselves and keep a roof over their heads. And this isn't me being mean. This is actually... A, a statistical truth. Roughly 10% of the population due to disability, whether a mental handicap or physical handicap, infirmity, illness, what have you. Roughly 10% of the population cannot support themselves. It would be a travesty for them to for us to just let them fall through the cracks. So that's why we have support services. This is why welfare exists. Even though welfare is horrendously broken, there is a need for it. So how do we pay for everything? How do we pay to keep our government functioning? Well, first of all, there's plenty of bloat in government we could get rid of. And we can go into just how I'm into all of that in my last uh, podcast. So I'm not going to get into that today. Let's talk about the actual funding of government. The solution is something called an endowment. For those of you who are unfamiliar with endowments, an endowment is a form of trust. And a... Um, Okay, let me, let me start and lay some groundwork. Trusts are a form of legal document, often formed by an individual or corporation or government, in order to achieve a set type of goal. Trust indentures often have the weight of law, and depending on what's in that trust, can actually be contradict law under certain circumstances. In fact, in most uh, states' trust laws, I don't know how this works outside of the United States, but in every state I've, of the United States I've been to, in their trust law, it states, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not licensed to practice law in any of the 50 states, that the trust indenture can actually countermand the trust law. The trust indenture is the document where it's all laid out. And in fact, to this day, many things are still invested in trusts. For instance, the crown of England or of the United Kingdom is invested in a form of trust. The Queen of England, Her Majesty Elizabeth II, her income comes from the Duchy of Lancaster. The Duchy of Lancaster isn't just the Duchy lands themselves. And in fact, I don't think she has any temporal rule over them directly anymore, uh, like she does the, the Duchy of Normandy. But it's a trust which has investments and lands and castles. Windsor Castle is part of this trust. And it's those possessed properties, the income from those properties and those stocks and things are what pay Queen Elizabeth 
her income. And she pays taxes out of it to the state. I am dead serious. You can look this up. So this is how Britain pays for their royalty. Why couldn't a republic use it to pay for the functions of state? And yes, taxpayers do pay for certain things for the queen. It's not all out of that, but there are certain functions of state that she does that are justified in Parliament to do taxes. I'm not going to get into the weeds on British, uh, the British head of state. That's beyond the scope of this. But largely speaking, her income comes from a trust. So let's talk about trusts and endowments. First off, an endowment is a form of trust. I will get into why we call this an endowment in a little bit, but really it's because the function of this type of trust is to fund something. That's usually called an endowment. Most college, a lot of, not most, a lot of colleges, like all of your Ivy League colleges, all have enormous endowments, which is why I look at the endowments, I scratch my head, and it's like, with the income from that endowment, you could provide your tuition for free and still fund half the research you're doing. So, again, if, if Harvard can do it, why can't state governments? So, okay. The trust indenture. The trust indenture is a document that states what the trust is for, how it functions, the rules for the trustee, which is the person who runs it, and how that trustee is paid, if they're paid at all, because a lot of them aren't, and what the purpose of the trust is and how it's going to achieve that goal. And it sh um, trusts can hold, trusts basically hold property. While they're not a corporation, nor do I believe they are they considered a citizen in any way like a corporation is, they basically have all of the abilities and powers of corporations in a lot of ways. Um, oftentimes, wealthy people or people who have um, oppositional relationships to their ex-spouse, especially when children are involved, will use trusts to make sure that the money that from their will goes to their kids or to their current spouse rather than to the ex. Because the, as long as the children are minors, an ex-spouse in a lot of places is still considered to have a vested interest in the decedent's money. They can use a trust in order to overcome that. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to get into the, reads, the weeds in this. Um, I will say I've, I've worked on trusts. When I was a banker, I was a trust banker. I dealt with a lot of trusts there. Um, I also dealt with estates, which is what um, dealing with decedents is. is the, when you die, everything you own becomes your estate. Alternatively, you can put all your stuff into a trust and then your estate's very, very minor because the trust technically owns all your shit. The final form of trust is an endowment, a purpose-built trust in order to fund a specific type of item or a specific purpose. Um, a lot of charities have endowments. A lot of people will leave endowments to charities by setting up a trust, putting money into them. A lot of rich people do this and saying, give the income to that charity until that charity closes. And if that charity ever goes belly up, then the trust will either go to this other place or they'll have contingency charities or find one like it, or they'll dissolve the trust and donate the, the remainder of the funds to something else. That's basically how it works. So how would we implement this system? So the idea is you set up an endowment. And any excess funds that the state has at the end of the year, because there will always be excess funds, and you can use this to encourage departments and agencies to have excess funds, spend what you need, but don't buy stupid shit. Like a lot of these agencies will go out and buy extra calculators at the end of the year to make sure they still get the same number of dollars next year. Because apparently states don't have enough forethought to realize that if you give people money and tell them you won't give them the same amount the next year, they're going to waste it on shit. Take all that spare money, you dump it into the trust. And you do it for like five years, right? Nothing comes out of it. It all reprinciples. And then, after that first initial number of years, the trust starts paying out half of its income. Half is a very important number. See, by paying out only half the income, the other half reprinciples, growing the trust in size. Every year, the amount of money paid out of the trust will increase. That money can then offset tax dollars, reducing the tax burden on the taxpayers. You can then begin to um, phase out taxes. And you do it very slowly. Maybe to ensure that the continuity of government and prevent lean years, 
the amount that you get that that's so the trust let's say the trust has a uh, hundred thousand in income this year fifty thousand goes to the state fifty thousand reprinciples the state takes that fifty thousand and reduces taxes by twenty five thousand for the year however they would reduce it by twenty five thousand maybe twenty five thousand of the most poor get an extra dollar in the returns checks so over time you are increasing the amount of money coming out of the trust reducing the tax burden on the taxpayer and the state is actually gaining ground on the funds they have to operate the state right see how this would work now i'm sure there are any number of legal mechanisms that would cause this to be kind of a pain in the ass to implement at first these are easily overcome by having legislatures that are self-aware and have enough intelligence to realize that oh we might have all the money we ever wanted in order to fund the bullshit that we throw into these stupid bills. And the taxpayers won't be pissed at us because we're not taking it out of their pockets. Okay. So, okay. How would this work? So, I've, I've already said how any excess money is going to the trust and it builds over time. Well, how do you get that trust income? Endowments themselves are designed to invest in things and there are different things you can invest in the fiduciary rule often means that what you're invested in is not um is not a voting type security mostly because even though the trust can own voting securities the problem with owning voting securities is you have a say in what goes on and you can literally vote against the interests of your beneficiaries unintentionally so let's say um I buy, I'm the trustee of this endowment that is benefiting a family, right? And there's five kids in the family. And so I'm the trustee and the trust owns 10,000 shares of company A. And company A is voting on whether to involve themselves in a generalized cut in wages, right? And so I vote as a shareholder, yes, this will give me better dividends for the trust, which is in the, benef in the best interest of my beneficiaries. Therefore, I say the cut in wages. Obviously, they're not going to cut wages, but it would be other capital expenditures. But this is a, an easy example because every once in a while, some bullshit like that does come up. So, okay. I've acted in the best interests of the trust because my dividends are going to go up, which means I can pay a higher rate to my beneficiaries. Except then I find out one of my beneficiaries is an employee of company A. So I've actually done a net detriment to that person. So it's in the best interest of a fiduciary of a trust to, and, and I don't think that the trustee would really get nailed for that, but you can see where the beneficiaries would come back to the trustee with baseball bats if something like that happened. So I, as a trustee would say, okay, I need them to be good investments that have a guaranteed, in, uh, a near guaranteed income. that are not going to negatively impact the value of the trust, if at all possible, and make sure that I'm limiting risk so that I can make sure I'm paying my beneficiaries out every single year. Okay. Solutions to that. Bonds in, blue, in um, investment grade bonds, which are in safe companies. Bonds are a debt instrument that you're literally lending money to a company and they're paying interest every year. This is how most retirements are funded, especially as you get older. A portion of you, the, the funds, like those target funds, the closer it is to the, your age of retirement, the more that are in bonds because bonds are considered um, fixed incomes. They're they're fixed. That you are getting the same percentage every single year. When the bond is when it's time to turn in the bond, you get your thousand dollars back. That easy. Mutual funds are another good way to do it. Mutual funds, as I've gone through in my personal finance for gamers series, are literally a company that invests in other companies. They limit risk by investing in a basket of different organizations. And so if I buy the mutual fund, I have an, uh, a distributed interest in all of the things they hold. And so if one thing fails, I'm not out a shitload of money. Another thing they can invest in is real estate. The trust can buy a building. Now, this would work less well for a government trust because you really don't want government in the business of running businesses. This is basically what China does. And that often leads to authoritarianism. Authoritarianism, bad. So, but we can use the, the good aspects of that idea 
because it's actually based on a very libertarian idea process. They just decided that instead of keeping their the government hands out of voting, they're going to demand they get a majority of it so the government tells them what to do. So the system can be corrupted very, very easily. You can word the trusts in such a way to prevent that from happening. So yes, I'm not saying this is perfect. Not by a long shot. But this is how you would do things. This is the way. So okay, you set up the endowment. So how do you set up the endowments in a way that each agency, there, there's a number of ways you can do it. You could do it, the broadest way to do it, and this is probably the least responsible way in a lot of ways, but it's the easiest. And, and you could do this in steps too. You start by trying to replace the general fund of a state. You set up the single endowment. Any cash that agencies have left over from the previous year flows back to the, the central treasury. The treasury looks at the overflow. Of course, they're also holding taxes that have been paid in for the, for the current year. That'll fund the next time's budget. They subtract those out. They put them in. They isolate those these funds from the next year's budget. And they put the leftover funds into the endowment. And then they don't penalize lack of spending on the part of those agencies. And you do this year after year after year. Now, once the general fund is starting to build... So you get that five-year period, five to ten years, where you're just building up in that endowment. It doesn't pay out, depending on what the, the income, the, the return is from these different agencies. Now, after that's in place, each individual agency does the same. So maybe it's five years to build the general fund because they're going to get a lot more money. Then each individual agency will spend five to ten years building up their own individual endowments. Now, you could say, Julian, what's the point of doing that? Well, one, by each agency having its own endowment, it reduces their dependency on the general fund. It will actually have a multiplicative effect on the amount of reduction that each agency has on the bur uh, of a burden on the taxpayers. Not only that, but should one agency have a major problem, it'll insulate the other agencies from the problems of the singular agency. What you'll end up with in the end is you'll have a big general fund to operate from that'll fund a lot of pieces of the, of the government. And then you'll have individual agencies that are really important like cabinet level agencies like transportation where they're not dependent on the general fund in case something goes sideways. Like, I don't know, COVID-19. So now you've got the system where you've got the general fund of the state and you've got the, the cabinet level agencies of the state all have their own funds. And they're not dependent on the general fund. They're not dependent on the taxpayer particularly in order to fund their actions. Now they can operate in the best interest of the taxpayers. Now, there there is an idea that this means it will relieve them from the burden of having to be good stewards of tax dollars. And in a lot of ways, yes, that is an issue this creates. And I, I'm aware of that issue. But at the same time, because you're not taking those funds out of the taxpayers' wallets, those taxpayers have much better lives. And you can use the funds from the general funds to fund things like social welfare programs. I know a lot of people, like in my state, we actually passed single-payer health care about 10 years ago. It was called Green Mountain Care. They actually had to repeal the single-payer aspect of it. Green Mountain Care still exists. It's Vermont's form of Medicare. Because the tax burden was so high, it would have destroyed our already damaged economy. And Vermont's economy never truly recovered from the Great Recession. Not really. Uh, to this day, our, our stagnant population and our suppressed wages and our high cost of living, living cause a lot of issues for Vermonters. And so when I ran, this was my solution to that problem long term. Now, of course, the other issues with setting up something like this are numerous, not the least of which are the fact that, well, election cycles are a thing. And in Vermont, particularly with a two-year election cycle, people tend to have very short memories. Long-term solutions don't win elections. However, long-term solutions are the only thing that tend to be permanent. This is a permanent long-term solution to the tax problem. The tax problem being that we have to pay taxes at all. This is not short-term. This does not happen overnight. And this does not mean it's easy. It doesn't mean there won't be issues. But this is my solution to the tax problem. 
Now, I know they're going to be, a, I, I, I want to cover this because this is something that I'm sure a lot of my viewers who are outside of the United States won't, and maybe even some of you in the United States won't really understand about why I set things up the way I did. So, when it comes to taxes or the U.S. federal system, a lot of people seem to think that the U.S. is a unified body much like a Norway or a France or an England is. We're not. Uh, we're actually, if you were to take the United States and look for a similar arrangement, you'd have the EU as a whole. It's a little different because in the EU, each of those member states still retain a large proportion of their sovereignty. Like, France can go to war and not in affect Germany, at least to my knowledge, fact check me on that. If I've got a member of the EU, uh, uh, a citizen of the EU in here, please correct me if I'm incorrect. But from what I understand, France could go to war and Germany could be like, you're on your own, bud. Um, in the United States, it works a little bit different. See, we are a federation. We're a federation of 50 semi-sovereign states that have a federal government to handle international relations essentially so each state is actually and this is why there's a lot of confusion like we have the states of the united states each state is actually a sovereign entity internally the only thing is is that the only limits to sovereignty on the states themselves is they aren't allowed to regulate interstate trade like between different states in the united states that's the federal government's rule and we can't do outside diplomacy like we have a lot of interstate compacts and stuff that's kind of an internal diplomacy thing um, and it operates similarly, but like Vermont can't go to Canada and say, hey, we want to negotiate trade. No, we have to go to the State Department of the U.S. who negotiates trade with Canada on behalf of Vermont. Um, I'm actually going to get into that. That's going to be a whole podcast series. But the reason that like each state would have to have its own individual way of doing things, and we could end up with 50 different endowment systems, and in fact, probably will, because... A lot of states are stubborn and have to do things their own way. They can do this without federal guidance, and the federal government can't do shit about it because of this thing called the Tenth Amendment. Now, keep in mind, the endowment system would fund the federal government too, assuming we could pay off the $27 trillion in bullshit debt that we managed to accumulate. Sorry. Soapbox. The Tenth Amendment states, um, in, in, and this goes into U.S. constitutional law, and I will, again, I'm going to do a whole series on this, but the 10th Amendment states, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This means the states handle their own internal affairs. Now, we could get into how, like, the federal government has done a whole bunch of other things where, you know, this, this starts to become questionable. What is the extent of the 10th Amendment? That's a whole podcast on its own. I can't wait for that podcast. I love the 10th Amendment. But what it comes down to is what are the the reasons that we'd have to do this individually to each state? And the, the fact of the matter is the way Vermont does things is going to be different from the way California does things, different from the way Texas does things, different from the way that Florida does things, different from the way the Fed does things. And all of that's going to be different from a way that Canada would implement it or the UK would implement it or Australia would implement it or Japan would implement it or China would implement it. And then actually, to be fair, kind of have implemented it. I will give them that. Kind of interesting when the communists came up with a fairly libertarian way to solve their governmental problems. Uh, authoritarianism aside. So, realistically speaking, this is doable. It's going to be a long time. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. And by far, it is not a simple solution. However, I firmly believe, and if you look at the way things are done, I think you'd come to the realization too, this is a much better way to fund government overall than by extracting wealth from taxpayers. And I mean that taxes are an extraction of wealth from the poorest all the way up to the richest. Now, you can justify that over various reasons, and I'm not going to get into that in this one. I, I actually have a, a conversation I now have planned with a friend of mine who is a leftist who, once COVID is over and we can secure studio space, which 
I probably only have to ask my buddy for. Um, we're actually going to look into having a conversation about, uh, in this case, we're going to be talking about the student debt crisis, but overall, I hope to convince him to do a bunch of conversations regarding um, so social democrat socially democratic or socialist methods of um, funding government and funding services versus the libertarian solutions. And I think there's going to be a lot of good conversations there. So we'll see what comes up in the future. In the meantime, I want to thank you all for, sh for if you're still here, you're awesome, truly. I really appreciate that you've come and you've listened to this whole tirade. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. If we're going to get ourselves out of the cyberpunk dystopia, we have to start eliminating the outdated forms of thinking. We need to come up with innovative new solutions to our problems. And I truly believe that by eliminating taxes, by funding, by funding government using alternative means, we will reduce the hold government has on its people and make it so that the people can truly seek out what their best destiny is. Until then, keep being a torch in the darkness. Keep being that subculture that says no, because we're navigating the cyberpunk dystopia. This is the Julian McBain Show. Julian McBain Show is a McBain Manor production. I want to give a big thanks to my moderators, Kat, Jay Lambertson, and Captain Aubrey, and to my patrons who make all of this possible, Red Kryptonite, Jay Lambertson, and Spectrum 3600. I really appreciate all the support. And you too can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash Julian McBain if you want to support my work. And you will find that I have my ebooks on there. I do have to begin work on my next ebook. I haven't quite figured out what that's going to be yet. But you know what? Death and Taxes sounds like a great idea.